This episode of Profiles and Risk is sponsored by IAPATH. IAPATH, unlocking your adjusting superpowers. Go to IAPATH.com. This is Profiles in Risk. Hosted by Nick Lamparelli. Every week, we interview those who risk life, limb, fortunes, career, and reputation, and those who work behind the scenes who look to protect and enlighten us about risk. You can find the show notes and other insurance-related content at insnerds.com. That's I-N-S-N-E-R-D-S dot com. Now, on to the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Profiles in Risk. I'm your host, Nick Lamparelli. On this lovely spring afternoon, right before Memorial Day, I am so pleased to introduce Amy Wanninger. Amy is the founder and CEO of Lead at Any Level. Lead at Any Level promotes in-the-trenches leadership, diversity and inclusion, and career management. Amy is also the author of a new book titled Network Beyond Bias, Making Diversity a Competitive Advantage. And she's an IT professional with 10 years in the insurance ecosystem. Amy, welcome to Profiles in Risk. Thank you very much for having me, Nick. Got a diverse background, IT, insurance, a book. We, we love talking to authors, especially one that's focused on networking and career development. Could you give us a little bit more of your background and talk about your career path? You bet, and I'm going to correct you for just a second. The full title of the book is Network Beyond Bias, Making Diversity a Competitive Advantage for your career. Perfect. And for your career is important because there are so many diversity and inclusion books that speak to companies and heads of companies, but not a whole lot of them. In fact, almost none that I can think of. I've been told none at all speak directly to the individual's career. So I just wanted to get that out there. But my background, I started in information technology I started as a software developer in 99, which was a great time to be a software developer, Nick, because companies were hiring like crazy and paying tremendous, at that time, hiring bonuses and sign-on bonuses for people just coming out of college. And I thought, hey, that I like money, so I'll go into computer science. <laughs> so you're rich. You're so rich. You're a rich. a rich kid. Yeah, no, I was not rich, but I was making a lot of money for what I thought I should be making at the time. Uh, can, was, can I stop you for a second? Did, did you study computer science in college? I did, but before that, I studied criminal justice. Wow, that's an interesting combination. Talk about that. <laughs> sure. Okay, we're going to go all the way back to like grade school now. So in, I grew up in the middle of nowhere, Southern Indiana, actually near a town called Santa Claus, Indiana. <laughs> no, That's really? That's a cool place. Yes. Look it up. Wow. Okay. Home to the nation's first theme park, Holiday World, which was also where I got my first job. So anyway, when I was growing up, it was a very blue collar area and almost no one I knew went to college. The only people I really knew who went to college were my teachers and my doctor. But because my parents had told me that I would go to college, I assumed everybody went to college. So I had no idea when I graduated high school what to do with a college education, what to study, how to prepare for a job. So I knew I didn't want to be a teacher. I thought, well, I know doctors go to college. I'll be a doctor. Over the next four years, I majored in literally everything. I majored in English, pre-med, pre-law, African-American studies, sociology. I tried to create like my own major at IU because somebody told me you could do that. That fell flat. That didn't work. I ended up graduating with a degree in criminal justice with minors in sociology and Spanish. And I wanted to go to law school and do civil rights law. And my senior year of college, I found out two very important things. The first was how much law school would cost at a school like Indiana University. And the second was the meaning of the phrase pro bono, which I had never (laughs) heard before. (laughs) So I realized law school was not in my immediate future because the kind of work I wanted to do would be volunteer work. So I got a very posh job at the mall selling CDs. Very posh. Very posh. The the exact job I had while I was getting the criminal justice degree, by the way, 
Now you need an archaeology degree to sell CDs to people. But <laughs> for, at that time, CDs were all the rage. So I, I worked at a record store and, you know, wanted a job with benefits. And I kind of kept falling into these same dead end jobs over and over again. I was working with someone at a, a small publishing company and they said, hey, why don't you go back to school for computer science? I think you'd really like it because you're good at math. And this was the extent of my indoctrination into what computer science would be. So I went back, I got a second degree with a, a second bachelor's degree with a major in computer science, a minor in math, and I started working as a software developer in 99. So that catches you up to like 20 years ago. Yeah. Perfect timing. Okay. Perfect timing, except after the Y2K bubble, companies started laying off developers. And so I found myself in the position of needing a new job. So there was a lot of hiring and letting go, hiring and letting go in IT at that time. And one of those times before I was able to anticipate that my job would be going away, I got laid off. I was 24 years old. I was six months pregnant. I had very little in the way of a professional network. And I wasn't really sure what my value was in the marketplace. I was terrified. I had a mortgage, baby on the way. And so a few jobs later, this happened. To me. And I got a job and I was fine, right? And a few jobs later, this happened again. Well, it happened several times <laughs> over the next few years. Companies would staff up, you know, dot-com bubble would burst. They'd all lay off. Companies would staff off. There'd be an accounting scandal. Companies would lay off, right? So it just kept going. And I realized... I'm, I'm actually in the process of writing a second book on, on managing change in your career. And I realized during this time, I was called into a conference room and they said, hey, all the developer positions are going to be outsourced to India and you have the option of staying for the next six months and we'll give you severance at the end of that six months or, you know, do whatever you want. We don't care. And I, I was just devastated and the people around me were fine and I couldn't figure out why. And then I was started looking at them. I was like, well, they're not six months pregnant and they have a big network in, you know, in town in this industry. And then I looked at myself and I was like, well, you know what? I'm not six months pregnant anymore either. And I've got a pretty good network in this industry. So I decided to stick it out, see what would happen. And then my career really took off from that point because I, I learned a lot. I started kind of changing how I approached work. So fast forward a few years, I ended up in an insurance company, which is how I, how I got mixed up in this motley crew of, of the INS nerds and <laughs> went into management, attained my CPCU. And I think I lost track of the question, but that's kind of my history. So 20 years in IT, about a dozen of those in management and about 10 in insurance. That's perfect because that's a perfect segue. So then lead at any level. What did you see that was underserved in the market that you said this needs to exist? Thank you for asking it that way. I love that question. So about six years ago, I learned that you can do diversity and inclusion work as a paid job, not as a volunteer job. And I thought, wow, that's amazing. How do I do that? Well, it, for me, it would involve a lot of retraining. I would have to go back to school. I would have to get a degree in human resource management. I would have to do a lot of different things that I don't have in my, in my arsenal right now. And the big question for me was, okay, it's great that there are people who do this and who you know, consult at the senior level. Executives are getting pounded with this message about diversity and inclusion. But what can somebody like me do? Right. And at the time I was like a frontline manager, middle manager in a really big company. The people around me were kind of lost in this conversation, not really understanding what it was, you know, how they fit in to the diversity and inclusion conversation. And I've always looked for people who are leaders wherever I am. I, the tagline of my company is that leaders can be anywhere and should be everywhere. And I've always looked for people who were leaders wherever they were, because there's always somebody on the team that's the early adopter. There's always somebody on the team that's kind of the flag bearer for whatever's going on, you know, that's bringing people in. And I really believe that if you nurture leaders everywhere in a company, your company moves forward much faster. You've got kind of these culture makers, right, all through the company. So as I was thinking about, well, what can somebody like me do in the diversity and inclusion conversation? I started reading a lot of books. Again, a lot of them were geared toward 
the executive or the senior leader and not to everyday people. There were a few out there that were. And about that same time, I got my CPCU and I went to the conference and I was just blown away. It was the first conference I'd ever been to in my 20 years of professional work. And so real quick, I want to do a shout out to anybody who's listening to this who's a manager. If you have a high potential employee, send that person to conferences. They don't know to go on their own. Send them because it it can be life changing for them. It can really open doors for them in ways that you may not anticipate. And what it did for me was it showed me that there was this whole world outside of my company that I didn't know existed. And I thought, well, how can I contribute to this, give something to the CPCU Society? So I noticed that there was not a diversity topic in the agenda in the program that year in Hawaii. And so I submitted a proposal to speak on diversity and inclusion the following year. I had three sentences and four bullet points, and they accepted my pitch. And now the pressure's on. And now the pressure's on. Now I have to have an hour's worth of content. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> to go with my three sentences and four bullet points. So be I started, care, be careful what you ask for. Exactly. And so I, I did my, you know, I started doing some research and the thing that I wanted to talk about wasn't in a book anywhere. And I heard someone say once, if you can't find the book you want to read, you have to write it yourself. And so that's what I did. So I wanted to pull in, you know, how can, an individual fit into the diversity and inclusion conversation, but more importantly, why would they want to? Why is that good for their career? It's a good segue because that's actually my next question. Um, We had Deidre Wright on this podcast and we talked about diversity and inclusion and I didn't really know the answer then and she kind of educated me. And I think probably a lot of listeners out there probably like me, I need repetition. You know, like, okay, yeah, I, I kind of remember it, but it kind of, you know, I, I need it to be bashed over the head a few times. Could you spend a few minutes and talk about the difference between diversity and inclusion? And we'll get right back to this episode right after a brief message from our sponsor. I am back with Chris Stanley, founder of IAPath. Chris, IAPath can handle individual as well as corporate adjuster trainings. What is a typical class size? Nick, with the technology that exists for hosting classes online, we can hold hundreds of students per class, but at IAPATH, we wanted it to be more personable. If we're going to sign off saying a student is competent, then we need to actually get to know the student. And we can't get to know the student if there are hundreds of people per class. That's why we keep our classes to under 20 registered students. And our certified partners are confident that we know the student and that that student knows their stuff. Learn to write auto, heavy truck, and other claims types with IAPATH's online trainings. Unlock your adjusting superpowers. Go to IAPATH.com. It's a good segue because that's actually my next question. Um, We had Deidre Wright on this podcast and we talked about diversity and inclusion. And I didn't really know the answer then. And she kind of educated me. And I think probably a lot of listeners out there, probably like me, I need repetition. You know, like, okay, yeah, I kind of remember it, but it kind of, you know, I I need it to be bashed over the head a few times. Could you spend a few minutes and talk about the difference between diversity and inclusion? Sure thing. So from my perspective, diversity is just a fact. Diversity exists in the world. And if we choose to embrace it, we're being inclusive. And if we choose not to embrace it, we are limiting our own potential. So diversity can be anything from a different educational background or a different physical ability or a different native language, right, from you. Anyone who, you know, anytime you're in a room with somebody who differs from you in any way, you have diversity. And if you can find a way to make a connection with that person and make that person feel valued, even if there are only two of you in the room, now you're being inclusive. And so, you know, I think small scale, this is important for individuals because maybe there are certain hangups we have about people who are different from us in some way that is maybe, maybe we haven't encountered before. And we're not sure what to do in that situation. So we stand off, right? We, we back off from, from the individual. 
And instead of making a connection, we kind of build a wall. And I think each of us individually has a, has a responsibility, but also just, my gosh, it's a great big world. And the more people you know, and the more people you can relate to, you know, the more you're going to learn, the farther you're going to go. Yeah, the, the, I think when most people think of diversity, they think of uh, skin color, gender, you know, other factors. But what you're describing is like diversity of thought, diversity of experience. And I, I guess I haven't really thought about it that way. But if you if you think about it in those terms, you automatically sort of get the others. Mm -hmm. Like if you're if you're looking at if you're trying to hire with different um, thought processes, different majors, different languages, different experiences, you're going to get your salad bowl of people that with all different kinds of backgrounds, different colors, different genders, different uh, sexual orientations. You're just going to get a whole bunch of stuff like that. And it might be very helpful for those that are listening that when they hear diversity to think of it in those terms and not just, you know, these cat, these very strict categories that I think that quite honestly, it feels as though we've been taught that it's, you know, it's very gender focused or color focused, but it's, it's more, much more nuanced than that, isn't it? It is. It, and that's, that's, I want to give you a both and answer to that. So yes, it is very nuanced and it's more than just, you know, someone having a different skin color, being a different gender. However, or, and those differences are really important too, because if we don't see those differences and we don't appreciate and value them, we're not seeing the whole person. We're not valuing the whole person. And I can give you a really simple example of that. Um, not related to race or gender, but let me just you know, give, me, give you an example of how, how we might be exclusive and not realize we're doing so. So I worked in retail many, many jobs ago. And one of the, one of the buyers for the department was a sporting goods retailer that no longer exists. And one of the buyers for one of the, the apparel departments said something about that we needed to, we were running low on wife beaters, so we needed to order more. And he was making, you know, very crude and, and not, you know, very impolite reference to, you know, the basic white sleeveless undershirts. And I don't know if he knew, but there was a woman in the department who had just left an abusive marriage. And the room got really quiet and I could, you know, I could tell that she was uncomfortable. And like I said, I don't know if this gentleman intended to be offensive or not, but it, it was certainly offensive, especially given the company that we were in. And it took an ally to stand up and say, Hey, you know, that term is offensive to me. Could we please refer to those as undershirts? And just that level of, of awareness about maybe who is in the room or who is not can make people feel like they're welcome in a space or not. And so I know a lot of times people will say, well, I don't see gender. I don't see color, especially when they're talking about their hiring practices. And the fact is we do see those things. We can't deny that they're there, right? You know, when you meet someone, you know, who they are and you would describe them that way if they weren't in the room. And so I think rather than pretending we don't see these differences, I think it's worth exploring why are we uncomfortable with them and how can we find out more? You know, I, I just came from a, com a conference where it, I happen to be white. I just came from a conference where I was one of two white women at the conference of over a hundred people. And it was absolutely fascinating because I had never been in that kind of a situation before where I was, you know, that much of a, of an ethnic minority in a group. And so, you know, it was, it was just interesting to put myself in that situation and hear how people, you know, how people talked when I wasn't, you know, when I wasn't in the majority, I think when we're in the majority, we're maybe our most candid, but when we're in the minority, we are perhaps our most emotionally intelligent, if that makes sense. Yeah. And vulnerable. And vulnerable. And it's important yeah. to experience that, especially if you're a leader. Yeah. I, I'll, I'll go back to the Deidre uh, Wright podcast that we had. And something she brought up that I hadn't even thought about is um, even if you're hiring, 
for diversity in what you know all the different ways that you can do it she made the point of well you know if you're a company and all of the senior executives are of one persuasion you could be hiring for diversity but there's no there's no sense of career path there because they look upwards and don't see anyone that looks like them at all or behaves like them or has the same experiences right so it, it's it's like a, a um it manifests itself in like a viral way, very mm -hmm. subtle, and it kind of gets out there and it probably uh, erodes at morale, productivity, down, you know, it's, it's just one of those things that can't be captured in a balance sheet or an income statement, but it's there and it's, its presence is like a, a leech. Absolutely, and I, I think to just put a little bit of a different spin on it, if you think about your own personal behavior, so Nick, if you were to walk into a room of 500 people, chances are you would first look for someone you already know and go talk to them first. And if you didn't find someone you already knew, you probably would not go integrate a group. So you probably wouldn't walk up to a group of, you know, if there were six women standing over, you know, in a circle talking and there were maybe six men in a different, you know, in a different um, group that were chatting, you would probably size up for yourself, where am I going to have the most in common with people and where am I going to be the most accepted? And you would walk probably straight to the group of men. Am I? Oh, yeah. That, okay. Yeah, definitely. Okay. So, and, you know, the same thing is true about race or, you know, like all these other things that we do, right? We go where we're the most comfortable. And when we're where we're the most comfortable because people are the most like us, we forget to look around and see who isn't there. And so the, the book that I wrote it actually comes from my own analysis of who was I spending my time with and was I doing it intentionally? And I realized that the network that I choose for myself, so I don't choose my work group, I don't choose my boss necessarily, but my professional network that I surround myself with on purpose was very white, very female, and very American. And when I saw that, it kind of felt like a kick in the chest because, you know, I've been very active in the diversity and inclusion efforts at my employer. I've been, you know, blogging about this, I've been doing a lot of work on this topic for quite a while. I've been very passionate about it since my youth. But even in my own circles, I wasn't, I wasn't walking that talk. And so I found a way to quantify for people how diverse is your professional network? And when they see it on paper, they're taken aback and they immediately want to fix it. And that's the power of this. So the changes that I made, for example, I started um, mentoring with, you know, a, a group of African-American professionals in my industry. I started mentoring with a group of Asian professionals. I started mentoring with a veterans organization because that's outside of my experience. Um, and so I started looking for these opportunities to broaden my perspective and to be maybe where I wouldn't ordinarily go on my own. And it's really, it's really enriched my own career and my own perspective. Yeah. So I'm going to ask for some counseling then since I, <laughs> since I have you here, I'm going to lie back on my couch. So, you know, I, I I grew up in in a small city okay. that was fairly urban, had a lot of immigrants. I am also an immigrant, so I was the first one in my family born here. So I felt uh, a little bit of a kinship, but I would say my background's been predominantly uh, white oriented mm -hmm. um, with the mixture. You know, you grow up in a city, you're, you're bumping into all different kinds of people. Um, I welcome, you know, I, 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 I favor the message that you're trying to, to present. I own a small business and I'm, I'm busy. So <laughs> when, when I'm trying to hire and I'm trying to do it quickly and painlessly, I can only lean back to the network that I've developed, which I admittedly is predominantly white and probably predominantly male. Right. Um, what can I do? As someone that is sympathetic to that message, I have no sinister motives, but right. I could probably fall into the trap 
if with enough time of creating an organization that's very male and very white. Yes, absolutely. And I think I think a lot of executives, a lot of business owners find themselves in that exact situation and they're not sure how to undo it or how to make changes. So I would say the first thing is look at if, if you work for a large company, get involved in employee resource groups in your company because that's going to expose you to people that are, first of all, in different places in your company that you wouldn't be able to work with normally, right? They may not be on your project team. They may be in another office. Um, so in addition to working on different things and living in a different geography, they're also going to have a different cultural background than you or, a diff, you know, whatever that is. In an industry like insurance, this is such a rich place because insurance is such a broad industry. I know that there's a National African American Insurance Association, or NIA, and they're having their conference this September. And I wonder how many of us in insurance that are not African American will show up at that conference just to listen and learn and make connections. Because certainly there are going to be, you know, hundreds if not thousands of very motivated, very high potential, very high caliber insurance professionals in the room. And, you know, things like that are an opportunity for us. Um, mentoring groups within the insurance industry. You know, I know there are, there are dozens of those around. There, are, If you just do a search on insurance industry associations for, and then fill in the blank, women, African Americans, LGBT, Asian Americans, Hispanic, Latino, you know, any, any group you can think of. And honestly, in any industry, there are these, these groups. And then just show up and listen. It doesn't always have to be about us, right? Just because, you know, as, as white folks were in the, in the dominant superculture, right? It doesn't mean it always has to be about us. We're not default, even though we see ourselves that way sometimes. And then I know, I know you're friends with Tony Kanyas, Nick, and I know Tony's listening. He better be listening. And Tony asked me one time, well, okay, so my, my network is pretty diverse, but it's 95% people in the insurance industry. Why would I want to change that? He's a recruiter in the insurance industry. He markets to the insurance industry. He's, you know, he's a thought leader in the insurance industry. Why would he want to get out of that space? And I said, well, gosh, Tony, you know, the insurance industry is not usually a tech leader. We're not usually on the front of emerging tech trends like artificial intelligence or mobile. Um, you know, what could we learn from the tech industry that would, you know, accelerate our ability to adapt in the world? The insurance industry affects every other industry on the planet and every other industry affects ours right? Finance, macroeconomics, every bit of it, globalization is affected by insurance and vice versa. And so if you can get out of, just out of the silo of the insurance industry even, and talk to people who are working on, on different things, you know, different trends and in different industries, or if you know that, you know, let's say you're an insurance agent and you know that there's, you know, a new office park in town because you have friends in the construction industry that are telling you about that maybe you can be the first one in, you know, to talk to the business owners there about, you know, liability insurance or something like that. So the more we get outside of our own cubicles and our own headspace, the more opportunity that's available to us. Yeah, that's a beautiful message. Uh, so let's let's dive into the book a little bit. Sure. Uh, Network beyond bias. So you, you you've already given some description of you know why you wrote the book and what it's about. Let's, let's pull out some of the stuff that was interesting. You, you made yourself very vulnerable, I have to say. So I, I read a chunk of it. And mm -hmm. one of the ones that really struck me was because I, I didn't understand the significance of it until you mentioned it again in another article. So I, I, I hope it's okay if we bring this up, but you outed yourself. I did. And, and that was, uh, that was very important that when you first, when I first read it, I didn't understand the significance of it. Could you go into that a little bit and why someone in your particular position, which anyone from the outside looking in would say, what's the big deal? You have your life. Why would you out yourself? Talk about why those kinds of small nuanced things do end up becoming a big deal. Sure. 
So forgive me if I struggle a little bit. I haven't talked about this a lot yet. Even writing about it, my hands were shaking. And if you can imagine typing with your hands shaking, <laughs> you'll, you'll know how hard this was to write. But let me give a little bit of personal background first. Um, I am married to an amazing man. This is um, my second marriage, my second husband. I have three kids. They are um, one turns 16 next week, one turns 10 this summer, my two boys. For my prior marriage, my daughter is two and a half. And um, so, you know, everyone who looks at me, who sees pictures of my family on my desk, who talks to me and, you know, and I say, oh, my husband and I did this or whatever, they assume that I'm straight. And that's fine to a point, but at some point it starts to me to feel like a lie because I'm in fact bisexual. And so what happens when people are in a group where they, they think everyone's the same, they may be very candid and they may not realize who's in the audience at the time, just like my, my friend who was in the room when, when the gentleman talked about, you know, when he used kind of an offensive term for, um, you know, related to domestic violence. And so where this really came to a head for me, though, was I was volunteering extensively in my employer's pride employee resource group or ERG. And when, when the pride ERG launched, they were very focused on home office activities. And here I sat in the Midwest saying, okay, but what about us? And then they expanded their reach to the coasts, right? Both coasts. And I said, okay, but what about us in the Midwest? And so I started showing up to, to leadership meetings that I was only kind of sort of invited to. And I started blogging at work about the importance of inclusion, inclusion of LGBT conversations at work. And what happened was a couple of people came to me and said, and asked me if I was hiring. And I said, no, I'm not, you know, I've got all the positions on my team are filled and you don't even do the kind of work that we do. Why do you ask? And they said, well, I feel comfortable with you and I don't feel comfortable everywhere here. And it really hurt me that they didn't feel like they could have a picture of their family on their desk. And it hurt me that they had to edit what they did over the weekend and who they did it with. And I kind of just kept going with what I was doing and I, you know, tried to be a resource for people when they came to me, but I still felt a little dishonest because I was still holding, holding this back. And, you know, I led our entry, my employer's entry in the pride parade for a couple of years. You know, I mean, I was really out there doing this work and I went to this very fancy uh, gala event in Boston. It was phenomenal. I was very, you know, I come from nowhere in the Midwest, right? I didn't know which fork to use. And I was shaking, scared, walking into this room. You know, I met a Kennedy for crying out loud. Like that doesn't happen in Southern Indiana, right? <laughs> so it was like so out of my depth. And what happened at this event and, and subsequent to this event, after I started meeting people more, they would say, wow, you're such a strong ally for us. What drives that? And I would find my, my throat catch because I didn't know whether to correct them and, and possibly offend them by making myself seen and being honest or whether to just say thank you and feel like I was lying about who I was. And so I started very small. I started just, you know, within the pride ERG, when people would say that to me, I would say, well, actually, I'm more than an ally. I'm a member of this community too. And then what would happen is I would be even at LGBT events. I would be at an event and I would say something about my husband or, you know, somebody would make the assumption then because I was in an LGBTQ event that I was a lesbian and I would correct them and say, well, no, actually I'm not an ally or actually, no, I'm not a lesbian. I'm bisexual. I'm married to a man. And they would almost invariably come back at me with, you know, how does that work? Or what does that mean? Or, you know, some really intrusive question about my personal life um, or some stereotype that, you know, they've been relying on for 20 years or, or whatever the thing was. So even within the LGBTQ community, 
I was getting that same kind of like kind of them wanting to put people wanting to put me at arm's length or not really understanding what I was there to do. And so, you know, I, I kind of had to laugh because it's like, wow, I, you know, I couldn't, when I was in it, it was like, Oh, you're really smart for a girl. Right. And I always felt like I wasn't doing it right because I wasn't, I uh, wasn't a boy. Right. And then it was like, well, I became like an analyst and a manager and they're like, Oh, well, you're, you know, you're really good with people, you know, for a developer. I was like, <sighs> and then, you know, it's like, oh, you're a really strong ally, you know, for a straight person. And I was like, well, no, I'm actually not a straight person. I'm bisexual. Oh, and I felt like, my goodness, I can't even be gay right. Like, I can't, like, what do I get right about this story? And when do I get to be who I but, am? Yeah, that's what I was just going to say. It, it, it takes you, it's not who you are um, and how you measure yourself. So it's, again, it, I, I started to get the sense of it. It's, because you can't fully express yourself, it's uh, it's in a way it's holding you back. It's not allowing you to uh, reap the rewards of being who you are in this world. Yeah, and I think too, you know, it's just about like if you had something, you know, let's let's take you know like like a silly example, but let's say you know, like if you've ever shown up to a to an event and like maybe you forgot to pack your dress shoes, right? And you walk in in your sneakers and your suit and you feel like, okay, I'll be fine. So long as I just sit here and I don't expose my feet and I keep my feet under the table the whole time, people will accept me as one of them. Right. But the second I get up out of this chair, they're going to wonder why I'm here and what, you know, who do I think I am to be in this space? And maybe I won't get invited to lunch if they see that I'm wearing my ratty sneakers that I rode on the plane with because I forgot to pack my dress shoes. Right. So something just as tiny as that, that we can be, you know, we find ourselves obsessing over in a meeting or in an event. And we, you know, we, you can't like fully participate because you're constantly worried about maybe somebody's going to see your shoes. Well, that's how people are with their identities, too. And so people may think, well, you know, if maybe I'm accepted, if I sit here very quietly and nobody knows that I am a member of the LGBTQ community. Maybe I could sit here really quietly and get the Appalachian accent out of my voice and people will under, will accept me as a professional. Maybe if I sit here really quietly and I don't bring up that I grew up in foster care, people will accept me. But there's always this fear that if this thing that's different about me is known, all of a sudden, nobody's going to want to work with me anymore. I'm not going to be, you know, I'm not going to be invited to sit at lunch with everybody else or whatever that fear is that we bring with us our, you know, our whole lives from childhood, right? Like, you know, you can't sit here, this seat's taken kind of mentality that we develop. And that's how it felt to me to always feel like, well, maybe if they really knew me, they wouldn't want me on their team. Maybe if they really knew me, they wouldn't want me to be here. I was tired of feeling that way. And I got to a point, Nick, where I was tired of other people feeling that way and I knew I was safe, but I knew other people didn't feel that way about themselves. And so I got to a point where I decided, you know what, I, I was actually, someone came to me and asked me if I would do this and if I would come out at work very publicly because they didn't know in a comp in a huge company, they didn't know any other person that was bisexual or that, you know, was out about being bisexual and I said, yeah, I can do that. No problem. And, you know, kind of went on for a little bit. And then it just kind of clicked for me. It's like, I just realized I'm going to out myself to 50,000 people in a couple of weeks. And it, it was terrifying, but it was at the same time so liberating because now there, there was nothing. If somebody wants me on their team, they know, you know, like I don't have to worry about this discovery of whatever, not that the discovery was ever a thing other than in my own head. But the real power of this, and the version of the book you read doesn't have it in there, but I've updated it since. The real power of this came after that when people started posting, you know what, I used to ask questions like that. I used to say things like that, and I need to rethink my approach. Um, and then even more touching to me were the emails that I got in confidence from people that said, thank you for saying what you said. Thank you for being who you are and being open about it. I still don't feel comfortable doing that, but I, I want to feel that way someday. And I thought, you know what, if I can just get a little tiny crack in, in that facade and that understanding for someone else to come through and be okay, 
then it's worth it to me. And that's, you know, I wanted to use my privilege. I have, you know, I have positional privilege. I have economic privilege. I have, you know, racial privilege. I have a lot of privileges. And if I can do that and make it just a little bit safe for somebody else who maybe doesn't have all of those advantages that I have, you know, then it, it's not for me. It's, it's for them. Yeah, no, that's, that's a fantastic story. That, that's a great segue over to pronouns because what you just described is a conversation that Tony Carly and myself had. Um, uh, Tony and Carly are big supporters of the LGBT community. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I mean, I can't say that I'm like, I, I'm not supportive. I just, I'm not as uh, outgoingly supportive because I, you know, I got a busy life and all of that other stuff. Right. So we talked about pronouns and Carly and Tony, I felt uh, were, were very gentle towards me asking me like, Hey, as a, as an insurance nerds policy, I think we should do that. Nick, would you have a problem with that? Now, when you say do that, you mean? Put, uh, announce the pronouns on LinkedIn to show your outward support. Okay. And I said, well, you know, honestly, I don't understand exactly what I'm doing. But if what you guys are saying, if I can give someone out there that's suffering a, a little bit of support and let them know that I am not, uh, that they can approach me. Right. You know, if that's a small thing that I can do, then... Yeah, like absolutely, and I can learn new ways to to support them in in other ways. I, I think uh, I think Tony was a little surprised that I was just like so open to it, but it gets to what you were saying, which is it's uh, in my privileged world, it's something very small yeah. that I can do, and and I don't want harm to anyone. And if someone is having, you know, I've had um, pain, emotional pain from other things, right? right. So. I, I can kind of sympathize a little bit if it's the, if the, if the pain is equivalent, it would have been nice to have someone out there to know, you know, knowing that I could approach and feel confident. So if that's the small thing that I can do, then we should do it. Can, just for the audience sake, in case um, it's, it becomes our own little internal dialogue. Right. Could you talk about pronouns? Absolutely. Again, go, go into like some of these small nuanced things that we can do to just make, the world a little bit better and make someone's life a little less onerous? Sure. Uh, Thank you for the question. So, you know, I think what you're talking about is in my email signature, in my bio, on my website, on leadatanylevel.com, on my LinkedIn page, everywhere I have a, a social presence, even at work, in my email signature, I have Amy C. Wanninger, pronouns, and then in parentheses, pronouns, she, her, and hers. This is not my invention. This is something that when I was at a conference for LGBTQ women, um, one of the speakers uh, was a trans woman. She was a a military veteran. She had transitioned. And she was, um, you know, giving us like three things we could do to be an ally to the trans community. And that was one of her asks was just put your pronouns out there and ask people for their pronouns. And the reason this is important is because there are a lot of individuals, there are 1.4 million trans individuals in the US, we think, we, you know, nobody has firm data on this, but the best research suggests 1.4 million, which is you know, the size of a large city. And so the odds are you know someone in your life who is uh, transgender. And they may be presenting as the gender that they were born with, or they may be presenting as the gender that they identify with. And in either case, you may not know that that individual is a transgender person. Um, So a very simple thing that someone can do if they wanna be supportive of the trans community is to put their pronouns out there. And what that says is, don't make assumptions about the way I look in relationship to my gender. And the first time somebody asked me about the pronouns in my signature, Nick, I was so nervous because I didn't know what to say. I was like, um, well, a trans woman asked me to do this in a conference, so I did. And I was like, well, that was a really crummy answer. So maybe I should figure out a better way to say it. But it's just about making 
making yourself a visible ally, making it okay for people to not exist purely in kind of the on off switch of gender, right? In that, that there's like a male and then there's this huge gap in female and we don't really allow for anything in between or overlapping. And there are a whole lot of people who find themselves in the in-between and overlapping space. And if you know someone is, you know, maybe, you know, maybe they're in transition and they're starting to use new pronouns, or maybe they don't identify as male or female. There are a growing number of people who identify as gender non-binary, which means they don't really feel like they belong in either camp and they'll use non-gendered pronouns like they or Z. And so if you ask for people's pronouns, then you know how to refer to them. Now I've had people say, well, isn't that kind of overkill? And, and Nick, I want to, you know, I put myself in that position, right. Of thinking about how would I feel if every time someone talked about me, they said, Oh, you know, Amy is a really good speaker. He gets up there in his high heels and he does a great job. And I, you know, I would be so like, that would just feel so wrong to me. And I'd be like, what are you doing? That's, you know, that's not who I am. And it was just such an easy thing for me then to think about, well, you know what, if I had lived my whole life that way, that would be a very painful experience for someone to just not see who I am. And so doing, you know, putting your pronouns out there helps, helps others know how to relate to you, but it also helps people who are maybe struggling to find an ally find you. It, there are some some benefits to doing this beyond the trans community too, if I may. Um, I have a friend who has a daughter whose name is Morgan, and she's frequently asked when she fills out forms for Morgan, okay, is Morgan a boy or a girl? Because Morgan's kind of a gender neutral name. Similarly, if you're dealing with people who are from other countries, they may not know just by looking at your name what what gender your name is traditionally associated with and vice versa. So it does kind of help it even kind of grease the skids on some of those introductions. If you know who you're talking to or about before you meet them. What, what did you learn writing this book? Oh, I learned that I have so far to go. So far to go. In, in what, in what ways? Well, you know, it, I can only cover about six dimensions of diversity in this book. And I, I picked the ones that I felt like were the most important to me. And a lot of the stories, as you mentioned, are very personal stories about, you know, my own struggle trying to, you know, understand difference, my own difference, other people's differences. Um, I think the biggest thing for me though, in writing the book was just learning that I have the tendency to default um, to places where I'm comfortable spaces where I look like I fit in and you know, it takes tremendous courage to put yourself in a place where maybe, maybe it's not obvious why you're there or maybe it's not obvious why you would bring somebody else in, but it's important. And as much as I say, we need to do that in the book and I truly do mean it. It's caused me to examine my relationships and my approaches to you know, my networking and my approaches to different things and making introductions so that I'm truly living this and, you know, and, and just living this, um, this inclusive ideal that I have for myself. The other thing that I've learned is it is amazing what doors it opens when you get out of your silo, when you step out of your own identity and start talking to people who are different you know, I've, I've made some amazing connections since I started writing this book because I had to challenge myself to do so. And it's created a lot of opportunity for me and for the people around me. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, can you talk a little bit about the book writing effort for those that are in the audience listening? Um, just, just a little bit shortly, like how much time did it take? How much research did you have to do? Um, and you said you were working on book number two. So if I had to ask you, would you do it again? I guess the answer would be yes. Absolutely. I can't wait to do it again. I can't wait to get this one done and out into people's hands so that I can start the next one. Um, because I'm, I'm really tired of proofreading my own work. I'm really tired of reading this book. I've read it about 15 times now. So 
<laughs> I've never read a book that many times. And it's a good book, but I don't know that you need to read it 15 times. Maybe, maybe just three, Nick. And <laughs> it'd be good. But, you know, my, um, my journey started with a blog. And I found a book by a writing coach, W-R-I-T-I-N-G, writing, not writing, R-I-D-I-N-G. Do you know, do you remember the name of the book? I do. The name of the book, it, actually there are two. One is called Blog to Book, How to Use What You, Something, Something, Something to Discover okay. the Book You've Already Written. Yeah. And we can put it in the show notes, right? Yep. Yeah. And the other one is called On Your Mark, From First Word to First Draft in Six Weeks. And those books were both written by my book coach, Kathy Fyock, F-Y-O-C-K. If you call her, make sure you mention my name because I like that. And, <laughs> but no, she has been incredible. And I sat down with her. I, I read her books. I really liked her, her writing style. And I thought, this woman could help me write a book. And she, she knows she gets it, right? She gets what I'm struggling with. And so I called her in December. She and I met for the first time on January 2nd. On January 4th, I had 54% of my book done and I was in tears because I couldn't believe I was that close already. And then I got stuck at about the 80% mark, Nick, because I was so afraid of, you know, i made myself very vulnerable in the book and I was very afraid. I had a lot of these fears about what, what's going to happen if I put this out there and how are people going to respond to it? And um, I got a little afraid and I was talking to Tony and he said, Amy, set a date for yourself. Tell people you're going to get it to them by this date and then you'll get it done and just stop worrying about it. And I said, okay, so I did. So I got the book done. I, my initial plan was to get it, get a draft finished by June and get it published by August. And I've accelerated that timeline. The book comes out June 4th. Fantastic. And it's available right now on Amazon and on my website. I don't know if I mentioned that. And if I did, I'm sorry, but. And we, will, <laughs> and we will link to it. Thank you. Yes. So I'm going to end uh, this podcast with trying to go on a personal note. And sure. I, I mean, we haven't been on a personal note already. Now. I know. That's what I was just going to say. You, you <laughs> wrote the book. You've already, we've already talked about so much of uh, what you've done to kind of make yourself vulnerable, but let's uh, let's spice it up and make it a little more, a little more fun. Um, we, I started doing wordplay games Oh yeah. I guess. So um, I'll throw something out there and just the first things that pop into your mind, blurt it out. Oh, this is scary. Okay. Yeah, I'm just know, it, I'm it, you know, if it's an F bomb, we can, we can fix that. Um, okay. <laughs> you have met me. Okay. <laughs> okay. First word, insure tech. Insure tech disruption. Good. Good. I like that. Uh, second insurance nerds. Insurance fun. Yes, isn't it? It is fun. Um, it's surprising because people that don't know insurance don't know how fun. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Indiana University. Hoosiers. What? What's it like? What's it? Is, that's a that's a that's a big school, isn't it? Like it's thirty thousand. Yeah. yeah, I'm not sure exactly the numbers, but yeah, it's a big school, a Big Ten school, and. Okay, so now I want to transition to um, something we ask all the guests, which are when you aren't working, and that means you're writing too. When you aren't working and you're not writing, what do you enjoy doing? So I have three amazing kids, and they will tell you that I'm always working, and I, I really want to dial back. Now that the book is done, I want to dial back on that, spend some time with them. Um, I love playing board games with my boys. We're you know kind of game geeks here. And we like you know, any game in particular. Oh, Settlers of Catan uh, is one of my favorites. We like, let's see, my my youngest likes. Um, com, I can't remember the name of it. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. You build a tree. Uh, my oldest just created his own game, and it, because of copyright laws, will not be able to release it beyond our household. But it was <laughs> fun. Um, so yeah, we like to play board games and, you know, stuff like that, card games. Um, we like to watch movies and with my little bitty girl, um, my God, she just likes to run and play and blow bubbles. And sometimes that's the most fun you can have is just watching her run and play and blow bubbles. Good. That's cute. Um, you've, you've been very busy. 
So how, what tools or techniques do you use to stay productive and or organized? Oh my gosh. If you could see my desk, you would not ask me that question. <laughs> so productivity, I think the key there is, um, setting deadlines is key for me. If I have a deadline and I write it on my, I have a, I have a calendar book and I write the deadline on my calendar book, not when I want to do it, but the actual deadline. Cause if I can see it there, then I know I'll get it done by then if no other time. Um, for organization. Oh gosh, I need to find a thing cause I don't have a thing yet. That's working for me. I get it. I'm, that's why I asked the question cause I haven't found that thing either. <laughs> So I'm hoping one of my guests can, uh, you know, innovate some kind of organization into my life. So that's fine. <laughs> okay. um, uh, books, besides your book, uh, what books in your life have you found to be influential? And that could be business and or personal. Sure. So I'll tell you the, the best business book I've ever read. And my apologies to everyone else who has written a business book. Um, it, the name of it is Love is the Killer App. It's by Tim Sanders. And I would say it's about 150 pages of pure gold. And I read it when I was, gosh, ages ago, ages ago. But he, and I think the reason it spoke so much to me is because I love to read. I love to connect ideas from different places and make something new. And his book is all about how constantly paying it forward, constantly connecting people to other people, constantly sharing ideas. And just kind of kind of giving away your awesome <laughs> is what attracts people to you and makes you valuable. And I've tried to live that. I you know, kind of think of myself as sort of a prophet of that book. And I, I try to live that every day. I hope that I live up to it. Um, but it's, it's one of my favorite books. And I've bought a gazillion copies to give out to people. I'm probably not allowed to buy anymore because Amazon probably thinks other books are <laughs> out. Um, and then, oh gosh, and then just like, non-work related so many so many books i wouldn't even know where to begin i loved um black boy by richard wright i read that in college and i thought that was a fantastic book okay i'm writing this down okay richard wright richard wright is an oh. amazing uh african-american author i'll put that on the show notes as well see the hour flew by it, that was an hour it, it was an hour it was a full hour. So, uh, Amy, thank you so much for coming on and educating us. And, uh, and best of luck with the book. And you're welcome on the show anytime. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, the book is Network Beyond Bias, Making Diversity a Competitive Advantage for Your Career. I got it. You got it. My guest has been Amy Wanninger. Amy, thanks again. Thank you very much, Nick.